the aspiration towards intimate knowing, the intimate knowing of oneself and others is a creative struggle towards redefining property. What the hell does that mean? Senator... Uh... Judge Katsubai, I think your fellow nominees owe you a debt of gratitude because... Many Biden nominees have been extreme, but your record is so far out of the mainstream that you have attracted virtually all of the questions. I was particularly intrigued by your statement to Senator Blackburn that you said you are not, in fact, a Marxist. Uh, and then you said, and I wrote it down, I have not praised Marxist ideas. Now, as you know, in law, there is the fact of evidence. And so let's go to something you wrote uh, an article that is entitled Centralized Property Theory, uh, in which you wrote, it begins, it's on the front page of your law school uh, newspaper, uh, you write, quote, intimate knowing, the lovers kissed, familiar and ever exciting, passionate transcendence beyond the physical exhilaration lies a burning light in our limbs, our hearts, floating, flying, falling in every direction, amorphous and wonderful, time-stretching, space-curving, exquisitely explosive eros, and yet I timidly tremble every time. Now, somehow this is about property, which is not immediately evident as to why, but later in the, in, in the uh, article you write, you say, property is not simply a relationship between an owner and an object of ownership. Property is primarily a complex relationship between people and secondarily regards the objects people exploit. Historically, three paradigms have dominated European notions of property. Locke, appealed to the notion that labor points to who has the right to exploit property. Bentham relied on utility to dictate who has rights based on how the property is exploited. And Marx was plainly disgusted with the alienation that property imposed and its establishment of an us and them and haves and have nots. Each theory alone denies important components of human experience. Among them are the ability to work, the need for personal pr privacy and boundaries, and uniquely diverse desires which spin us all in differing life directions. However, the process towards integrating all three may provide a framework for relationships that enhances each unique self. The aspiration towards intimate knowing, the intimate knowing of oneself and others, is a creative struggle towards redefining property. What the hell does that mean? Senator, uh, when I was preparing and reviewing uh, my materials and, uh, for this hearing and for the, the process, uh, I also have to admit that uh, that writing was far from clear or articulate, and, and the poetry was definitely not good. Now, Senator, I, I don't do, make... Do you I, believe I, we need to have a creative struggle towards redefining property, which is what you were advocating for. You know, th that was something that I wrote 30 years ago, Senator, and in, in the course of just uh, you know, exploring law school and the ideas that came with Okay, so your flirtations school. with Marxism were 30 years ago, so let's go more recent. In 2020, you gave a speech entitled Reflections on Equity and Privilege, and you said, quote, first, the world is wide enough for all of us. Privilege derives its power from the belief in scarcity, scarcity of money, natural resources, food, and power itself. The desire to control it all drives privilege. I want to suggest to you that equity, the idea of equity, rejects this model of scarcity. Now, that's Marxism in 2020. I've, what did that mean? I've, I've never considered that to be Marxist, Senator. Uh, it's the idea that equal access, and in the context of the work that I do here. So, so course, there, is, there is no scarcity, there are no property rights, equity gives everyone an entitlement to each other's property, is that right? Not at all. Uh, uh, and in the context of the work that I do on the bench, Senator, when you look at my record for all of these 16 years, you will find that I, I have uphold, upheld the Constitution and our case precedent. Okay, well let's turn to something else you wrote in the Wisconsin Women Law Journal. Again, this is your writing. Uh, the name of the article is Destabilizing Power and Rape, Why Consent Theory and Rape Law Has Turned on Its Head. You cited Professor Catherine McKinnon, who argued, quote, sexuality itself is a power web in which heterosexual relations per se are infused with violence and control, and, quote, most intercourse 
is rape. Now, her views are extreme, and yet, and, and when Senator Blackburn asks you about them, here at the hearing, when you want to be confirmed, you, you try to distance yourself from them. But here's what you wrote in the article. You embrace those views. You wrote, quote, I employ the view that rape is sex in order to focus on the significance of consent and rape law. The Sex Act is a violation per se without consent. In order to properly align the consent doctrine in rape law with consent in other areas of law, non-consent must be presumed. Do you believe that is a mainstream view that, that heterosexual sex is rape? Senator, uh, in that article, I was exploring different ideas and theories, and I w was employing the hypothetical that you've just described to try it, to tease out a particular issue with, res with respect to consent. Uh, with respect to your last so question... So you also quoted Professor McKinnon, who wrote, quote, Sexuality is to feminism what work is to Marxism. Let me ask you again, what does that mean? Senator, I, I was summarizing different theories uh, that people w were presenting so that way I could explain them and, 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 and then employ a, an analysis with respect to the issue of, of what consent was in the context of sexual assault back in 30 years ago. I, I think your views are far, far out of the mainstream.